Hello, I'm Dr. Otis Corbett and welcome to Corbett's Comments. Today I'm commenting on Isaiah chapter 63 verses 7 through 9, which read, I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all the Lord has done for us and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. On the first Sunday after Christmas, when I was a child, many young boys would have been praying with playing with their new Christmas presents, including G.I. Joe's. Now, G.I. Joe's were very popular amongst young boys when I was a child, and they were not called dolls. No, they didn't want to offend people by calling them dolls because boys didn't play with dolls. No, boys played with action figures, and G.I. Joe was an action figure. And in fact, in the UK, where uh, G.I. Joe was marketed as uh, Action Man, uh, it was something that uh, appealed very much to the young boys in that place. It was not as militaristic as G.I. Joe, but apparently it was equally adrenaline producing and it was very popular. You see, action was a key marketing element for both of those toys on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, what we have to see is that action is not just a marketing element for toys, but it's also a very key element in life. You see, nothing happens until something moves, as one transportation company motto goes. Nothing happens until something moves. And as good uh, of intentions people have, good intentions without actions to follow them up are useless. They really don't help anybody. And so what we're glad to report today is that our God is an acting God. He is the action God. And what we see in this passage of Scripture from Isaiah chapter 63 are some of the gracious deeds of the Lord that He has done for His people. And one of the first things we see is that our God has graciously adopted us. Our God has graciously adopted us. Now, what we know is that birthing a child is a natural act. What we find is that adopting a child is not so much a natural act, but it's an act of intention. You are bringing someone into your family who was not a member of your family before. We probably all know about the story of the little girl who had been adopted, and at a certain point in her childhood, she was being, um, being mercilessly uh, uh, ridiculed and, and being cruelly teased by other children because she was adopted. Now this young girl was resilient and she was wise because she retorted this. She said, my parents actually chose me. Your parents had to take whatever they got. You see, choosing to adopt somebody is a powerful act and our God graciously adopted us. You see, in our natural state, we were estranged from God, just like that little girl was estranged from her adopted parents. And, and, and we were foreigners to him, just like she was a foreigner to those people who adopted her. Now, this is a major theme of the book of Ephesians. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, wrote this, At that time you were without the Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. What dismal and dismaying and discouraging prospects that, were, that those were. I mean, how terrible it is to be excluded from the promise of God without hope and without God in the world. But thanks be to God, he acted. He sent Jesus to redeem us and allow us to become part of the family of God. You see, in the very next verse and several verses following that in Ephesians chapter 
2, Paul wrote this, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. A few verses later, he says, When the Messiah came, he proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to one by one spirit to the Father. So then you were no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. One of the most praiseworthy deeds of our Lord God was to adopt us into his family. But more than that, we find that God has graciously redeemed us. God has graciously redeemed us. If we look back in the Old Testament and we look at the book of Ruth, we see a great love story. Ruth is a tremendous love story. But the, the scope of the love story doesn't stop with just the relationship between uh, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, from that great passionate love one for another a mother-in-law and a, and a daughter-in-law we get the famous passage that we often adapt for weddings in which ruth tells naomi entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee for whither thou goest i will go and whither thou lodgest i will lodge thy people will be my people and thy god my god you see it's it's a great love story, but it's a very natural one because, you know, Ruth had known Naomi for a long time. She knew her well, and they had come to love one another as daughter and uh, mother, as mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. So that was a very natural thing for her to, to give her love and her dedication to someone who loved her. But no, the greatest love story in the book of Ruth is not the story the love story between Naomi and Ruth. It was the love story between Boaz and Ruth when Boaz acted as the kinsman redeemer for both Ruth and Naomi. Now, there were provisions in the law of Moses that required the nearest male relative of an Israelite to assist that person if they came in need. If someone was indebted, for example, and had sold themselves into slavery to pay off that debt, then the kinsman redeemer would have to buy them out of slavery if he could. It is interesting to note that the fiduciary benefit to the kinsman redeemer for doing this was very limited. It was really an act of love that originated in the heart and life of the kinsman redeemer. And so it was with Boaz. You see, he did not know Ruth. He had probably never met her. Uh, but yet he welcomed her into his family. And then by extension, he took on the burden of caring for Naomi as well. And what's so great is we have a kinsman redeemer too. And that kinsman redeemer is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. His sacrifice on the cross for us defeated death and hell. And it allowed us to be redeemed from our slavery to sin. This is a gracious act of love which we did not deserve, one which originated in the heart of God himself and not anything in our lives. Another one of the most praiseworthy deeds of our God is for Jesus to be our kinsman redeemer. So we see that God has graciously adopted us and that uh, Jesus, through God through Jesus, has graciously redeemed us and God has also graciously lived with us. He has lived with us. Now, one of the false theologies uh, that's current in our world today is deism. And this, this theology postulates that God created the world and ordered it, and then he left it alone for it to develop without his help, without his guidance, without his nurture. Now, this concept recognizes that God is our Savior. So we see in Isaiah 63 that God has graciously adopted us and he has graciously redeemed us. We also see that God has graciously lived with us. He has lived with us. You know, one of the 
false theologies of our day is called deism. Deism postulates that God created the world and he ordered it, but then he left it alone to develop itself. Didn't give it any guidance, doesn't give it any uh, assistance. He doesn't nurture the world. He doesn't nurture creation. He just lets it spin all on its own. Now, this concept does recognize that God is our creator, but he denies that he is an eminent God or one who is intimately involved with his creation. And in this worldview, God is sovereign, but he just doesn't care enough to be involved with his creation. It, it, in essence, uh, he doesn't care about the world. He is an absentee landlord. Now, nothing could be further from the truth than that. You see, from the very beginning of creation, we see God intimately engaged with it and with us, his people. In Genesis, we read that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And that after the fall changed his relationship with Adam and Eve, he made them clothes so that they would no longer be uh, embarrassed by their nakedness. Now, does that sound like an absentee landlord? Of course not. In fact, the biblical record is that God has always been engaged with his creation. For example, Proverbs 21.1 says, in the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels to all who please him. It's a stream of water that he channels to, to all who please him. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, we read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own, own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Jeremiah 31, 33 tells us, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their, in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Our God has always been intimately involved with his creation. Now, the ultimate expression of God's eminence is the fact that he came in the form of a man through Jesus, his uniquely begotten son. And he lived among us. Uh, another name of Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Uh, and in Philippians chapter 2, Paul put it very beautifully. He said it this way. Jesus, being the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Uh, but rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being a found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And of course, death on a cross was a, was a terrible thing. It was a, it was a humil humiliating thing. It was a disgraceful thing. And yet, our Lord and Savior was willing to be obedient to that point, and he was engaged with the earth. He came to the earth to do that very thing. So one of the most praiseworthy deeds of our Lord and our God is that he lived with us and that he continues to live with us today through his Holy Spirit. So we see that God has graciously adopted us, and he has redeemed us, and he's lived with us, but also, our God has graciously lifted us. He has graciously lifted us up above ourselves. Now, it's a natural instinct for parents to want their children to have improved lives over what they had, to, to have better living conditions, to have better prospects. And so they often go the extra mile to make that happen. Now, these sacrifices pay dividends. For example, one young adult recently told me how grateful she was to her mom for carrying her to tutoring sessions during her high school years. And these tutoring sessions allowed this young woman to get a college scholarship. And so now she's in the working world and her young peers are all struggling to pay off their college debts and their college loans, but she doesn't have any. In fact, she has money in the bank in savings because her mother sacrificed to take her to those tutoring sessions. And not only that, she encouraged uh, this young lady and uh, helped her to see the value of it in the day, but even more, she sees the value of it now. Now, our God loves his children far more than any other human parent loves their children. He loves to see them lifted up and their lives improved. The way he does this is by helping us to be disciples. As Paul taught in Ephesians chapter 4, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, 
the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the, in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking of the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. You see, our God wants us to grow up and be mature, and he wants us to benefit from being a disciple. He wants us to avoid the schemes of the world and the, the, the waves that toss us true and to and fro. He wants us to be lifted up. And so one of the most praiseworthy deeds of our God is that he loves us enough to lift us up through discipling us. You know, we have many things we should praise God for, but one that we see here in our focal passage today are particularly powerful and important. Our God did not have to adopt us or redeem us or live with us or lift us up, but he did. He did these things because of his loving grace and because of who he is. Our God is praiseworthy indeed. And the gracious deeds of our Lord that we've talked about today are truly worthy of our praise and adoration. And I commend that to you in the end of this year and the beginning of the next. So thank you for watching and may God bless you. And uh, thank you again for being a part of Corbett's comments.